Good morning, my friends, members, and visitors of Greenhaven Lutheran Church, and welcome this morning to our virtual worship together over the internet. Uh, because of the COVID-19 coronavirus situation, we deemed it better for us not to gather as a group, just simply so that we could maintain this new social distancing that they are talking about. But nevertheless, we are still a Christian family. We are gathered this morning in the name of Jesus to worship him. And whether there is a common roof over us at this time or not, does not change the fact that our Lord is with us and will bless our worship of him as we glorify God for his son Christ and the redemption that we have through our faith in Jesus. So welcome to worship to our visitors. If this is the first time that you have worshiped with us, we would like to welcome you. Please stay tuned to our website and our Facebook page uh, for further information as to when we will gather again together to worship physically. We're hopeful that that will be at the beginning of April, perhaps on Palm Sunday. Our website is www.greenhavenlutheran.org, and you can find our Greenhaven Lutheran page on Facebook as well. I encourage you to look for us, to like that site, and join us there as well. Until that time, we will continue to hold these virtual worship services uh, and allow God to work through the technology that he has blessed us with in order to bring us the word of God on this Sunday morning. So again, welcome to worship. This morning we will worship according to the Lutheran service book, Divine Setting Service Number 4. This morning we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. My dear friends, since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise. And enjoying in the fellowship of this congregation, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We join together then now for a moment of silent confession before God. Joining together, Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Friends, because of our sin, we would be forever separated from God. It is our sinful nature, from the sin of our first parents there in the garden, to the sin that you and I continually commit day after day, that we are separated from our perfectly good and righteous God. And there is nothing that any of us could do about it. No amount of good work can separate us from the sin that has stained us. But here's the good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together in the Kyrie, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, 
Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Lord, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to hear your word and obey it, so that we become instruments of your redeeming love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue now with the reading of God's Word. Our Old Testament reading this morning is a lesson from Isaiah chapter 42, verses 14 through 21. We read. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pop pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. And I will lead the blind in a way they do not know. In paths they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame, who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind? but my servant, or deaf as my messenger, whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as a servant of the Lord? He sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness' sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. Here ends our first reading. Our second reading this morning, our epistle lesson, is a lesson from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 14. We read. Paul writes, For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are children in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead and Christ shall shine on you. Here ends our second reading. The good news of Jesus Christ this morning comes to us from the ninth chapter of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. This is, of course, the account of Jesus healing the man born blind. And in light of the current events of our world today, with the unknown of this coronavirus, I think God in his timing has given us this reading in our lectionary at just the right time. I encourage you to think of the world events, of how our medical sciences today are scrambling to address this issue of COVID-19, and then as we look at the Word of God, how God in his power through his Son Jesus Christ heals the man, not only of his physical calamity, the blindness, but God also gives healing of a great, much greater nature, and that is, of course, faith, faith that saves. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, Jesus answered, It was not this man who sinned, or his parents, 
but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him while he, who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, Jesus spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Now some said, It is he. Others said, No, but it is like him. He kept saying, I am that man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? The man said, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and I received my sight. They said to him, well, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put, he put mud on my eyes, I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. So they said to the man born blind again, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? And he answered, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. And they asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, Well, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for, for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. The man answered, well, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, well, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciples, but we are the disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, well, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God will listen to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin. And you would teach us? And then they cast him out. Now Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and, and having found the man, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. The man answered, Lord, I believe. 
And he worshiped him. And then Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Well, are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say you see, your guilt remains. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Amen. I invite you to join me now as we confess our Christian faith this morning with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Greek word kairos is a word that we translate into the English as time. But, but really, that's an insufficient translation because kairos is a deeper meaning. The word that we understand as time in the Greek, like what we would do with our watch, time telling, is the word chronos. That's where we get chronographer and so forth, those, those kinds of chronograph kind of words. But the word kairos really is better translated as God's time. Now let me tell you something, friends. I am time and again awestruck by God's perfect timing, how God's timing works. Now, of course, I, because we're meeting today virtually over the internet, worshiping together, you're aware of the, our government's recommendations and the CDC's recommendations to us regarding this COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. In fact, that's why we decided now a week ago to close our church offices and, and to, tr to close the Angel's Nest Priesthood. However, I, as pastor, have come to the church on a number of occasions during this week just to ensure that, that everything is okay with our campus, to collect the mail, and, and so forth. And, and so on Monday morning, I came in all by myself and, and to, to go ahead and start my study on our text that we just read a, a little while ago, and, and to start my sermon prep for today. And I figured, well, there's, there's nobody going to be here at the church, so I would have no problem with this six-foot social distancing that the government is, is recommending us to do. And so, as I sat down in my, in my office all, all by myself that morning, and, and I looked at our text, especially our reading here from John chapter 9 this morning, I really smiled. Because I thought, of, wow, this is Kairos. This is God's timing. Now, of course, we just read of the account of Jesus healing the man born blind. You know, that was, without question, a true miracle. Now, where some of the other illnesses of Jesus' day, the, the illnesses that, that Jesus healed, for example, leprosy, we can heal those diseases today with our modern medicine. So it's really, truly a, a rare event to hear of a person born blind, born with congenital blindness, to be given their sight. We can't even do that today. And yet Jesus did so in the most miraculous of ways that, that really led me to think of, of this text. Again, God's kairos, God's perfect timing. It speaks to all of us today, doesn't it? God's timing, God's ability to heal during this time where here in our community, 
and frankly, the entire world just really hunkers down to get this whole coronavirus issue under control. Now first, I'd have you think of something. How did Jesus make the mud that he used to, to put onto the man's eyes? Jesus, the text tells us, spit upon the ground. I mean, ew. I know that Jesus is God in the flesh, so spit, I guess, would be holy as well, but, but spit? Again, kind of, ooh. <laughs> you know, right here in the midst of this whole situation of the coronavirus, I think most of us would clearly steer away from another person's body fluid, especially spit. We're told that the, the virus can be transmitted by, by micro particles that, that come from a person when they sneeze or, or when they speak. And I bring this up because maybe this isn't really a, a theological point, but, but it makes me wonder, how would we, how would I react if, if I needed to be healed of something? Now, be that the coronavirus, or the flu, or cancer, or heart disease, whatever it is, if, if in the midst of this pandemic, somebody were to offer to heal us with their spit. Again, as I said, I, I really have no theological point here other than to, to encourage us to think about it. But, but indeed, God worked through such amazing ways. But here is a theological point for you, my friends. You know, of late, I've had a number of people come to me or call me and ask, Pastor, why is God allowing this to happen? Why doesn't God do something about this? Can God stop the coronavirus? Now let me tell you something, friends. These are all very good and relevant questions. I want to tackle it and then see what we can learn from this current world pandemic that is in harmony with what God tells us through his holy word, through, through scripture. First question, can God heal a person who has coronavirus? Well, friends, of course he can. We just saw him heal a man who was born blind by making mud and putting it on his eyes and then having the, that person washed in a pool, which, by the way, in and of itself, wasn't exactly that clean and sanity. That means one thing. That, that means that a miracle happened. God made the physiological changes to the man's body, to his eye, and probably to nerves, and maybe even in his brain, in order to heal his sight. So certainly, God in his omnipotence, his ability to do anything, could eliminate coronavirus from any person's body. And you know what, friends? We should be bold and pray to him and ask him to do just that for those people who are inflicted. Will he? Perhaps. Then we remember that God sees and knows far more of the big picture that, that spans not only time and space, then our little, tiny, sinful human brains can even begin to comprehend. But let me tell you something, and make no mistake, friends. With one word, with one thought, God can heal. Next, why is God allowing this to happen? Why doesn't God do something about this? Yeah, friends, these are excellent questions. Nobody should be criticized for asking these questions. So let me answer this question by taking you back to the beginning and asking another question to put things into perspective. Why didn't God stop Adam and Eve from eating that forbidden fruit? I mean, think about it. Every illness, all death that is in our world today is a direct result of sin. Those who became ill, even through no fault of their own, with coronavirus or cancer 
or the flu or heart disease, whatever that condition might be that ails them or ails humanity. They all became ill. They all became sick because of one specific reason. And that is, we are born sinful and we continue to sin every day. Sickness and death are a direct result of sin. So, with that in mind, we almost want to ask the question, is God then being vindictive? No, friends. Of course not. See, it is simply the result of the fact that our sin has made us imperfect. God created humanity in perfection to live forever. And it is our own decision to sin that corrupted, that destroyed that perfection. See, friends, God had a specific reason for creating humanity. He created us so that he could love us and that we could love him in return. And without question, think about it, love is intimately and directly tied, connected to our free will. I mean, what kind of love would it be if we loved without free will? I would argue that such love would hardly be anything better or higher than, say, an animal's instinct to care for its young. So my point with all of this, my friends, is this COVID-19 coronavirus is, is not something that, that God is setting as punishment into our world as a, as a result of something that you or I or maybe we collectively have done wrong. It is simply the end result of our own decisions to be sinful meaning to be imperfect. Can God do something about it? Again, make no mistake, yes, of course he can. He is omnipotent. And guess what? He does. But he does so in a way that will never restrain or restrict or alter or change our free will. Will there one day be a vaccine for the coronavirus? I bet on And God will give our medical field, scientists and physicians and all those researchers who are working so hard in finding this vaccine, he will give them the wherewithal to do so. But again, friends, it'll be in his kairos, right? It will be in his good and perfect intentional timing. Why not now when we want it? instead of in his perfect timing? Well, friends, that is another good question. And let me tell you, it's one that I can't directly answer other than, again, to remind you that we can't see and know what God knows. For example, could God have kept me from the horrible sin of joining the Mormon church, of becoming a Mormon, when I was in my early 20s? Yeah, of course he could have but then he would have taken away my free will. And did God lead me out of Mormonism? Of course he did. Again, in his time, remember I was a part of that cult for about six years. And during that time, God surrounded me with loving Christian family and friends who reminded me really daily of the power and the beauty of the gift of free salvation by grace through faith. In other words, it kept reminding me, you don't have to earn your salvation because Jesus has done it for you already. Just believe in the Jesus of the Bible and receive that grace. And did God make good use out of my time in Mormonism? My sin? Yeah, and friends, you bet. See, I wouldn't be wearing this stole I wouldn't be an ordained pastor of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod today, had it not been for my time in Mormonism. Because coming out of Mormonism, it gave me such an acute understanding of the power of grace. I came to understand Paul's words when he told us again and again that we are saved outside of works, that it's already done. 
that Jesus had saved me and that I was bought at a price. My sin, in the short term, without question, brought me much pain and suffering and grief. But in the long run, God put that to good use. And he brought much good to hundreds, if not thousands of people that I've been able to touch now over these 10 plus years in the pastoral ministry. He's been able to touch because God called me to the pastoral ministry with an acute understanding of what it is like to not know Christ and Him crucified, Him as our Redeemer. And so I would have you think about that, friends, and, and connect that now with our current world event. Now, how can I see any good coming out of the coronavirus? I'll be blunt with you, friends. I can't. But then I'm not God. What I do know is that God always, I want you to hear this, God always makes good out of a bad or difficult situation. He always makes good out of evil. It's, it's just as Joseph said to his brothers at the time of his father, Jacob's death, of their selling him into slavery. Joseph said to them, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Friends, likewise, God will make good out of these events. Now in the meantime, we remain vigilant. We keep the faith. We remain calm, cautious, proactive. We remember Jesus' words that he is the Son of Man and that regardless of what happens in these next few days or weeks or maybe months with the coronavirus, Jesus Christ remains on the throne. And our salvation is always and will always remain an accomplished event. The words of our Savior Jesus in verse 39 of our reading. For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Friends, may we see the, his goodness in our lives. Such abundant goodness that no virus, no pandemic, or any other earthly calamity can ever trample. Friends, your pastor loves you. God be with you. Amen and amen. Join me in prayer. Father God, during this time of uncertainty, we hold on to you as our rock. Because with you, there is no uncertainty. We know that we are each individually and intimately known by you, loved by you, redeemed by this grace that your son Jesus has accomplished for us. And so during this time of uncertainty, Lord, may we be that beacon of light to our world, that they may find that same peace and comfort that we know in knowing you as their Savior as well. These things and all others we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the true faith which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us turn our hearts now to a time of prayer. We pray, Blessed Lord, you give sight to the blind. You open the ears of the deaf and you make the lame to walk. Hear the prayers of your people on behalf of all people as they have need. In the darkness of sin and its death, we cry to you, O Lord, open our ears by your word, our minds by your spirit, and our hearts by your grace, that we may know and be thankful for all the blessings you have given to us in Christ our Lord, especially the gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation. Strengthen us in faith that we may serve you with all of our body, mind, soul, and strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bidden by your word, we pray to you, O Lord, on behalf of your church and your people at every place. Give to us good pastors and servants of your word,
who will preach the full counsel of your word and serve us with your sacraments. Raise up many more to serve as church workers and bless those who are now preparing for full-time church work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Enjoying the riches of your grace, we ask you, O Lord, to give us generous hearts that we may sh share with the poor what you have provided and work for the common good of all. Be with those who are unemployed and in search of honest labor, the underemployed in pursuit of better jobs, and the homeless seeking basic shelter for themselves and those in their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Knowing your healing will and gifts, we pray you, O Lord, to remember the sick in their afflictions, to calm those troubled in mind, and to keep steadfast the dying. Hear us especially for the family of Paul, Bonnie, Steve, Austin, John, Kristen, Renata, Pauline, Dale, Jennifer, Julie, Pastor Bill, Joan, Julie, Kathy, Cindy, Nancy, Lisa, Maria, and Steve. We also lift up prayers for first responders, doctors, nurses, our military, especially our California National Guard as they begin to be activated and mobilized during this time of our crisis. Show us your gracious will, O Lord, and sustain those who are afflicted in body or mind until that day when they bestow upon us new bodies fit for the eternal life you have prepared for us in Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mindful of your promise, we ask you, O Lord, to comfort those who grieve and to build up those who mourn with hope for the resurrection. Remembering the faithful who have died in Christ, we pray you bring us at last to be with them in your nearer presence, looking forward to the day when we shall join in the marriage supper of the Lamb and his kingdom without end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things, O Lord, we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, asking you to grant our prayers, not for the, our sake, but for the sake of him alone. Teach our hearts to be content with your will and to trust that you will answer us with what is best for us and at the right time for our need. So do we pray, giving testimony of our confidence in your gracious favor in Christ Jesus by answering with one voice, Amen. This is the time, of course, now in our worship where our corporate worship in the sanctuary where we would return to God our tithes and offerings. Since we are not meeting together physically, I invite you to mail your offerings to the church office at 475 Florin Road, Sacramento, 95831. Now as we conclude our worship, let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.